It is July 18, 1984. This is not a typical summer day. 41-year-old James Huberty will fatally shoot 21 people and wound 19 others, before being killed by a police sniper, approximately 77 minutes after he had first opened fire. At the time, the massacre was the deadliest mass shooting by a lone gunman in U.S. history. James Oliver Huberty was born in Canton, Ohio, the second of two children. Both parents were devoutly religious, and the family were regular attendees at local United Methodist churches. When Huberty was three years old, he contracted polio. To minimize the debility of this ailment, he was required to wear steel and leather braces upon both legs. Although Huberty made a progressive recovery from this ailment, he would be afflicted with a mild limp for the remainder of his life. In 1950, his father purchased a 155-acre farm in Mount Eaton. His mother refused to live in a rural location and refused to even view the property. Shortly thereafter, she abandoned her family to perform sidewalk preaching as a Pentecostal missionary in Tucson, Arizona. Huberty found his mother's abandonment emotionally devastating. His father would later recollect finding his son sobbing numerous times about his mother's abandonment. Huberty was a sullen child with few friends whose primary interest was target practice. By his teens, Huberty was something of an amateur gunsmith. Due to his limp, his family's extreme religious beliefs, and his reluctance to socialize with his peers, Huberty was frequently targeted by bullies in high school. In early 1965, Huberty married at Namarkland. Shortly after his marriage, Huberty obtained employment at a funeral home in Canton. Although proficient at embalming, Huberty's introverted personality made him ill-suited to dealing with members of the public, causing minor conflicts with his superiors. Nonetheless, Huberty worked in this profession for two years before opting to become a welder for a firm in Louisville. Shortly after Huberty was hired by this firm, he and his wife moved into a three-story home in an affluent section of Massillon, Ohio. In the winter of 1971, this home was destroyed in a fire. Shortly thereafter, James and Etna bought another house on the same street. They later built a six-unit apartment building on the grounds of their first home, which they managed. Their two daughters, Zelia and Cassandra, were born in 1972 and 1974, respectively. Huberty had a history of domestic violence, frequently slapping or punching his daughters, holding knives to their throats, or beating his wife. On one occasion, Etna filed a report with the Canton Department of Children and Family Services, stating that her husband had messed up her jaw, although she later insisted on the majority of occasions he had assaulted her, he struck her only once. Beginning in 1976, Etna repeatedly attempted to persuade her husband to seek counseling to alleviate his sources of stress, although he refused to seek any form of therapy. In personal efforts to pacify her husband's temper, anxiety, and general paranoia, and to both influence and control his behavior, Etna took great efforts to minimize any possibility of agitating her husband. She also gradually developed a mechanism whereby she claimed to be able to read his future by reading tarot cards. Huberty believed her. Etna's readings would produce a temporary calming effect, and Huberty would typically follow the recommendations his wife made in these readings. To his neighbors and co-workers, Huberty was perceived as an ill-tempered and somewhat paranoid individual, obsessed with firearms, and who harbored a mental tally of every setback, insult or general source of frustration, real or perceived, against himself or his family within his mind. Occasionally, Huberty would retaliate in response to any real or perceived injustice, in an effort to settle what he termed his debts and conflicts with his neighbors would once lead to his detainment on charges of disorderly conduct. A conspiracy theorist and self-proclaimed survivalist, Huberty believed an escalation of the Cold War was inevitable, and that President Jimmy Carter and, later, Ronald Reagan and the United States government were conspiring against him. Convinced of an imminent increase in Soviet aggression, Huberty believed that a breakdown of society was fast approaching, perhaps through economic collapse or nuclear war. 
he committed himself to prepare to survive this perceived collapse and provisioned his house with ample reserve supplies of non-perishable food and numerous guns, some purchased from co-workers, guns he intended to use to defend his home, during what he believed was the coming apocalypse. According to one family acquaintance, Huberty's home was bedecked with loaded firearms to such a degree that wherever Huberty was sitting or standing within his home, he could just reach over and get a gun. Each firearm was loaded, with the safety catch disabled. In November 1982, Huberty was laid off from his welding job, causing him to become despondent over his dire financial situation and general inability to provide for his family. One co-worker would later recollect that Huberty had made a comment, saying that if he was unable to provide for his family, he intended to commit suicide and take everyone with him. According to Etna, shortly after her husband became unemployed, Huberty began hearing voices. In early 1983, he placed a loaded pistol against his temple, threatening to commit suicide. Etna successfully dissuaded her husband from shooting himself, although he later remarked to her, you should have let me shoot myself. Unable to find lasting employment in Ohio, James and Etna Huberty sold their six-unit apartment building in the spring of 1983. Weeks after he became unemployed, Huberty and one of his daughters were injured in a traffic accident. In the weeks following this accident, Huberty noted an aggravation in neck pains he had endured since childhood. He also noted on occasions increasing nerve tremor in his hands and arms. In the summer of 1983, the Huberties applied for residency in Mexico, believing the money obtained from the sale of their apartment building would financially sustain the family longer in Mexico than in America. Having also sold their home, Huberty informed family acquaintances of his intentions to relocate his family to Tijuana in search of employment opportunities. When Huberty and his family moved from Ohio to Tijuana in October 1983, he left all but the most essential of his family's possessions in storage in Ohio, but ensured he brought his huge collection of guns, ammunition, and survival supplies with him. Unable to find employment in Tijuana, Huberty quickly regretted his decision to relocate to Mexico. Within three months, the family relocated to San Isidro, a largely poor district of San Diego just north of the Mexico-United States border. In San Isidro, the family rented an apartment as Huberty sought employment. The fact his family were the only Anglo-Americans within their apartment complex irritated Huberty, who was notably rude to his neighbors. But again, Huberty was summarily dismissed from this job. His employers told Huberty the reasons for his dismissal were his poor work performance and a noted general physical instability. Three days before the massacre, Huberty commented to his wife that he suspected he had a mental health problem. Two days later, on the morning of July 17, he called a San Diego mental health clinic, requesting an appointment. Leaving his contact details with the receptionist, Huberty was assured the clinic would return his call within hours. According to his wife, he sat quietly beside the telephone for several hours, awaiting the return call before abruptly walking out of the house. Unbeknownst to Huberty, the receptionist had misspelled his name. His polite demeanor conveyed no sense of urgency to the operator, and he told in the phone call that he had never been hospitalized for mental health issues, therefore, the call had been logged as a non-crisis inquiry to be handled within 48 hours. Approximately one hour later, Huberty returned home in a contented mood. After eating dinner, Huberty, his wife, and their two daughters, aged 12 and 10, cycled to a nearby park. Later that evening, he and Etna watched a film together on the TV. The following morning, Wednesday, July 18, Huberty, his wife and children, visited the San Diego Zoo. In the course of their walk through the zoo, Huberty told his wife that his life was effectively over. Referring to the mental health clinic's failure to return his phone call the previous day, he said, well, society had their chance. After eating lunch at a McDonald's restaurant, the Huberty family returned home. Shortly thereafter, Huberty walked into his bedroom wearing a maroon t-shirt and green camouflage slacks, as his wife lay relaxing upon their bed. 
He leaned toward Etna and said, I want to kiss you goodbye. Etna kissed her husband, then asked him where he was going, stating her intention to soon prepare the dinner. Huberty calmly replied he was going hunting, hunting for humans. Holding a gun across his shoulder and carrying a box of ammunition and a bundle wrapped in a checkered blanket, Huberty glanced toward his elder daughter, Zelia, as he walked toward the front door of the family home and said, Goodbye. I won't be back. Huberty then drove down San Isidro Boulevard. According to eyewitnesses, he drove first toward a supermarket and then toward a U.S. post office branch before entering the parking lot of a McDonald's restaurant approximately 200 yards from his apartment. At approximately 4 p.m. on July 18, Huberty drove into the parking lot of the McDonald's restaurant on San Isidro Boulevard. In his possession were a 9mm Browning semi-automatic pistol, a 9mm Uzi carabine, a Winchester gauge pump-action shotgun, a box and a cloth bag filled with hundreds of rounds of ammunition for each weapon. A total of 45 customers were present inside the restaurant. Entering the restaurant minutes later, Huberty first aimed his shotgun at a 16-year-old employee named John Arnold from a distance of approximately 15 feet. As he did so, the assistant manager, Guillermo Flores, shouted, Hey John, that guy's going to shoot you. According to Arnold, when Huberty pulled the trigger, nothing happened. As Huberty inspected his gun, the manager of the restaurant, walked toward the service counter of the restaurant in the direction of Arnold, as Arnold, believing the incident to be a distasteful joke, began to walk away from the gunman. Huberty fired his shotgun toward the ceiling, before aiming the Uzi at the restaurant's manager, a 22 years old young woman, shooting her once beneath her left eye. She died minutes later. Immediately after shooting the woman, Huberty fired his shotgun at Arnold, wounding the teenager in the chest and arm, before shouting and demanding everybody to get on the ground. Huberty then referred to all present in the restaurant as dirty swine Vietnam assholes, before claiming that he had killed a thousand, and that he intended to kill a thousand more. Upon hearing Huberty's profane rant, and seeing the two people shot, one customer, 25-year-old Victor Rivera, tried to persuade Huberty not to shoot anyone else, in response, Huberty shot Rivera 14 times, repeatedly shouting, shut up, as Rivera screamed in pain. As staff and customers tried to hide beneath tables and service booths, Huberty turned his attention toward six women and children huddled together. He first killed a 19-year-old, Maria Colmenero Silva, with a single gunshot to the chest, then fatally shot nine-year-old Claudia Perez in the stomach, he then wounded Perez's 15-year-old sister, Imelda, once in the hand, with the same weapon, and fired upon 11-year-old Aurora with his shotgun. Aurora, initially wounded in the leg, had been shielded by her pregnant aunt, 18-year-old Jackie. Huberty shot Jackie 48 times. Beside his mother's body, 8-month-old Carlos Reyes sat up and wailed, whereupon Huberty shouted at the child, then killed the infant with a single pistol shot to the center of the back. Huberty then shot and killed a 62-year-old trucker, before targeting a family seated near the play area of the restaurant, who had tried to shield their son and his friend beneath the tables with their bodies. A 31-year-old mother had shielded her 11-year-old son beneath one booth, as her husband, Ronald, protected his child's friend 12-year-old Keith Thomas, beneath a booth directly across from them. Ronald Herrera urged Thomas not to move, shielding the boy with his body. Thomas was shot in the shoulder, arm, wrist and left elbow, but was not seriously wounded. Ronald Herrera was shot six times in the stomach, chest, arm, hip, shoulder, and head, but survived. His wife and son were both killed by numerous gunshots to the head. Nearby, three women had also attempted to hide beneath a booth, 24-year-old Guadalupe Del Rio lay against a wall. She was shielded by her friends, 25-year-old Gloria Ramirez and 31-year-old Vilvas Vargas. Del Rio was hit several times but was not seriously wounded. Ramirez was unhurt, whereas Vargas received a single gunshot wound to the back of the head. 
she died of her wound the next day, the only person fatally wounded who lived long enough to reach a hospital. At another booth, Huberty killed 45-year-old banker Hugo Velasquez Vasquez with a single shot to the chest. The first of many calls to emergency services was made shortly after four. The dispatcher mistakenly directed responding officers to another McDonald's two miles from the San Isidro Boulevard restaurant. This error delayed the imposition of a lockdown by several minutes, and the only warnings to civilians walking, riding, or driving toward the restaurant were given by passers-by. A young woman named Lydia Flores drove into the parking lot. Stopping at the food pickup window, Flores noticed shattered windows and the sound of gunfire. Flores reversed her car until she crashed into a fence. She hid in some bushes with her two-year-old daughter Melissa until the shooting ended. A Mexican couple drove toward one of the service areas of the restaurant. Noting the shattered glass, the couple initially assumed renovation work was in progress and that Huberty was a repairman. Huberty fired his shotgun and Uzi at the couple and their four-month-old daughter, Carlita, striking the mother in the face, arms and chest, blinding her in one eye, and permanently rendering one hand unusable. Her baby was critically wounded in the neck, chest and abdomen. Astolfo was wounded in the chest and head. The man was wounded in the chest and head. As the couple staggered away from Huberty's line of fire, they gave their shrieking baby to a young woman named Lucia Velasco. Velasco rushed the baby to a nearby hospital as her husband assisted the couple into a nearby building. All three members of the family survived. Three 11-year-old boys then rode their bikes into the west parking lot. Hearing a member of the public yell something unintelligible from across the street, all three hesitated before Huberty shot the three boys with his shotgun and Uzi. Joshua Coleman fell to the ground critically wounded. He later recalled looking toward his two friends, Omar Alonso Hernandez and David Flores Delgado, noting that Hernandez was on the ground with multiple gunshot wounds to his back, and it started vomiting. Delgado had received several gunshot wounds to his head. Coleman survived. Hernandez and Delgado both died at the scene. Huberty next noticed an elderly couple, 74-year-old Miguel Victoria Aloa and 69-year-old Ada Velasquez Victoria, walking toward the entrance. As Miguel reached to open the door for his wife, Huberty fired his shotgun, killing Ada with a gunshot to the face and wounding Miguel. An uninjured survivor, Oscar Mondragon, later reported observing Miguel, cradling his wife in his arms and wiping blood from her face, shouting curses at Huberty, who then approached the doorway, swore at Miguel, then killed him with a shot to the head. Approximately 10 minutes after the first call had been placed to emergency services, police arrived at the correct McDonald's restaurant. The first officer on the scene, Miguel Rosario, rapidly determined the location and cause of the actual disturbance and relayed this information to the San Diego Police Department as Huberty fired at Rosario's patrol car. Officers deployed immediately imposed a lockdown on an area spanning six blocks from the site of the shootings. The police established a command post two blocks from the restaurant and deployed 175 officers in numerous strategic locations. These officers were joined within the hour by several SWAT team members who also took positions around the restaurant. As Huberty was firing rapidly and alternating between firearms, police initially were unaware how many individuals were inside the restaurant. Because most of the restaurant's windows had been shattered by gunfire, reflections from shards of glass provided an additional difficulty for police focusing inside the restaurant. Initially, police were concerned the gunman or gunmen might be holding hostages, although one individual who had escaped from the restaurant informed police there was a single gunman holding no hostages and shooting any individual he encountered. At 5 5 p.m., all responding law enforcement personnel were authorized to kill the perpetrator. Several survivors later reported observing Huberty walk toward the service counter and adjust a portable radio, possibly to search for news reports of his shooting spree, before selecting a music station and further shooting individuals as he danced to the music. 
Shortly after, Huberty searched the kitchen area, discovering six employees and shouting, Oh, there's more, you're trying to hide from me, you bastards. In response, one of the female employees screamed in Spanish, Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Before Huberty opened fire, killing 21-year-old Paulina Lopez, 19-year-old Elsa Borboa Firo, and 18-year-old Margarita Padilla, and critically wounding 17-year-old Albert Leos. Immediately before Huberty had begun shooting, Padilla grabbed the hand of her friend and colleague, 17-year-old Wendy Flanagan, before the two began to run. Padilla was then fatally shot, Flanagan, four other employees and a female customer, and her infant hid inside a basement utility room. They were later joined by Leos, who had crawled to the utility room after being shot five times. When a fire truck drove within range, Huberty opened fire and repeatedly pierced the vehicle with bullets, slightly wounding one occupant. Hearing a wounded teenager, 19-year-old Jose Perez, moaning, Huberty shot him in the head. The youth slumped dead beside the booth he had been seated at. Perez died alongside his friend and neighbor, 22-year-old Gloria Gonzalez, and a young woman named Michelle Carncross. At one point Aurora Pina, who had lain wounded beside her dead aunt, baby cousin, and two friends, noted a lull in the firing. Opening her eyes, she saw Huberty nearby, staring in her direction. He swore and threw a bag of French fries at Pina, then retrieved his shotgun and shot the child in the arm, neck, and jaw. Aurora Pina survived, although she would remain hospitalized longer than any other survivor. At 5.17 p.m., Huberty walked from the service counter toward the doorway, close to the drive-in window of the restaurant, affording a police SWAT sniper an unobstructed view of his body from the neck down through his telescopic sight. The sniper fired a single round from a range of approximately 35 yards. The bullet entered Huberty's chest, severed his aorta just beneath his heart, and exited through his spine, leaving a one-square-inch exit wound and sending Huberty sprawling backwards onto the floor, directly in front of the service counter, killing him almost instantly. The entire incident had lasted for 77 minutes, during which time Huberty fired a minimum of 257 rounds of ammunition, killing 20 people and wounding as many others, one of whom was pronounced brain dead upon arrival at hospital and died the following day. 17 of the victims were killed inside the restaurant and four in the immediate vicinity. Only 10 individuals inside the restaurant were uninjured, six of whom had hidden inside the basement utility room. Several victims had tried to stanch their own wounds, and the wounds of their companions with napkins, often in vain. Prior to shooting several of his victims, Huberty had shouted accusations or insults. On one occasion, he had also shouted that he himself did not deserve to live, but that he was taking care of this matter. Although Huberty had repeatedly shouted that he had been a veteran of the Vietnam War, he had never actually served in any military branch. Initial reports issued by the San Diego Police Department following the massacre indicated that everyone injured or killed within the restaurant had been shot by Huberty in the initial minutes after he had first entered the restaurant. This claim was hotly disputed by survivors, who stated Huberty had shot both wounded and unwounded people over 40 minutes after he had first opened fire. The day after the massacre, reporters visited James Huberty's father to garner further information about his son. Having discussed his son's childhood and the family's religious background, Earl Huberty pointed to a painting of a lost sheep by the Jordan River before beginning to weep, telling reporters, Yesterday was the worst day of my life. I feel so sorry for those people. McDonald's temporarily suspended all television and radio advertisements in the days following the massacre. In an act of solidarity, arch-rival fast food chain Burger King also temporarily suspended all forms of advertising. Huberty's body was cremated on July 23, 1984. No official religious service was observed throughout this act. His ashes were returned to his widow and later interred in his home state of Ohio. In the weeks following the massacre, Huberty's wife and daughters received numerous death threats, forcing them to temporarily reside with a family friend. 
All three would attend counseling sessions for over nine months. The massacre prompted the city of San Diego to assess the tactical methods by which they responded to incidents of this nature, and the firearms in the possession of responding officers. The police department increased training for special units and purchased more powerful firearms in order to better equip law enforcement to respond to scenarios of this magnitude. The San Diego police chief held a press conference to disclose the results of the San Diego Police Department's inquiry into their response to the massacre, and the fact that an estimated 73 minutes had elapsed between the time the first police officer had arrived at the restaurant and Huberty's death. The results of this internal inquiry found that although the arrival of SWAT team members was delayed by rush hour traffic, the police acted appropriately in their method of response. Colindar stated any suggestion police should have stormed the restaurant was ludicrous, adding that officers had been unable to obtain a clear view of the gunman because windows had been spider-webbed by bullet holes, making visibility in direct sunlight difficult. The police chief finished his report by stating, I believe the operation was handled the way it should have been handled, 